Welcome to the Psychology World Podcast. I'm O'Connor Whiteley, bringing you psychology news, articles and other interesting psychology related articles. Here where I can find the podcast notes and more interesting psychology related things and here where I can get your free 8 psychology book box set at ConnorWhiteley.net. Now let's get on to the show. Hi everyone and welcome to episode 161 of Psychology World Podcast with me, Con Wiley. And today's episode is on what is a coercive control. And it is Friday the 22nd of July 2022 as I record this. So the reason why I wanted to do today's really great podcast episode is because I was on my phone on the other day. Um, and because I signed one petition a few years ago on like change.org that like whenever a so-called interesting like petition actually like comes up. And most of them are like to be honest honest though like i always tend to get like an email and there was a like a petition now like other day i done now by this domestic abuse survivor and like what she did up is that she told us like her story and that she actually wanted um like a teenagers had to actually be a taught about coercive control and domestic violence in a school and make it illegal for like requirement so what i decided to do was to sort of like I don't know, to help honour her experience, like, in a way, I really wanted to do, like, today's episode, so that's why we're looking at coercive control, because we do tend to look at um, domestic abuse or topics around that to some extent already on the podcast, but we've not looked at a co- um, coercive control until now, and is really, really interesting, so you've got that in the content part of today's episode. But moving on to the psychology news section, well, it turns out that the British Psychological Society Research Digest is moving to a new website, so they're not actually producing any new stories at the moment. But and like until then, and um, then like they're actually advertising, but they're like most popular stories from the past. So we're sort of going to have a like, look at them. But the problem is, is that we've actually looked at quite a few of them on the podcast before, but we've not looked at this one, which actually focuses on ten findings. Uh, about the better side of human nature. So we're not going to look at all the ten, no, ten though, but there are some that I want to highlight. For example, kids as young as two are surprisingly selfless. We tend to think of other toddlers as selfish creatures, not just um, toddlers, most children. <laughs> but it seems that very young children are for social than not we give them a credit for. In one study, pairs of two-year-olds are given a set of... Uh, um, marbles that made a nice sound when I pinned to a box that children are not exactly renowned for sharing. Yet the team found that about half the time the kids divided up the marbles are fairly. Only 19% of the trials that did a one child self she take all of the toys for them herself. So, so that, so it does like go on like a, a bit more, but this I think is actually quite important to actually realize though that, that sometimes our perceptions of the children and our perceptions of the different groups and uh, people that it does and need to be addressed and sometimes actually like research but kids yeah but kids are like, generally but they are great and i do um like i see now my like, nieces and nephews but i wouldn't want to spend all the time because sometimes you just want to turn around to them and say just share just share for goodness sake <laughs> well and another interesting one is our personalities have light dimensions. They just haven't been studied as much as dark ones. Thousands of papers have been published on the so-called dark, uh, dark attrait of our personality traits. Narcissism, psychopathy and Machiavellianism. And <laughs> I do enjoy saying like, that word. All associated with undesirable behaviours like manipulation, egotism and callousness. But this focuses on the undesirable side of our personalities. Miss have represented the full capacities of our humanity, according to Scott Barry, Kaufman and their colleagues earlier this year, and this was done in um, 2019. Earlier in the year, the a team published a, a new scale to measure what they called the light triad, made up of humanism, and a word that I can't say yet, but what it means is it is a treating people not as a means to an end, but as the end itself and a faith in humanity, or I think I would um, score quite low on like the last one recently. <laughs> um, so well, the work was egg exploratory and is still in its early days, uh, but the team found that high scores on the light triad traits were associated with a greater quality of life, and overall where people generally scored higher on the light triad than the dark triad. 
Yeah, but this is something that I actually quite like about the more modern, like, say, ecology business because before, and to be honest, we are still do to most, yeah, you know, but like some, I guess, and we like, or we always tend to focus on the bad side of like um, uh, human behavior. Like, uh, right, for example, like forensic psychology, the entire field of psychology, as much as I love it and I'm still researching it. It's just all focused on uh, criminality, the downside, etc. Even yeah, but like even like clinical psychology, that's putting more of a positive spin on people suffering with their mental health. So again, focuses on like the bad, but that's why positive psychology, which personally is something I do not focus on in the slightest. I think I've mentioned it. I think there was a small section in a podcast episode around christmas 2021 no well christmas um 2020 actually and that's all this podcast has ever done on that positive side of ecology and i don't think it's that going to change any uh, yeah but like any time soon though but that's the uh, good thing about that particular area though without we do focus on the positive side of human behavior and we will do one more quickly one of our guiltiest pleasures may be motivated by feelings of empathy and compassion the rise of reality to you that you might seem might seem like a sure sign of, of the worst excesses of a few humanity. The fact that we will spend our free time watching a strangers of relationships fall apart or people having their dreams crushed in front of an audience of millions doesn't exactly inspire confidence in our species. And yet, according to a 2016 study, our driver to watch a reality T that you might have all but together more positive signs. Researchers gauged a participants' opinions on that reality shows like a Big Brother and a MasterChef and asked how much do they like the participants in these shows and what they think of a family member if they wanted to take a part. The more the people in enjoyed the shows, the happier they said that they'll be for themselves or the loved one to a participate. The authors say that the findings suggest people watch a reality TV because they emphasize they empathize with the contestants, not because they like to see people being humiliated. Otherwise, they would surely be against their loved ones taking a part. Well, <laughs> depends on the loved one. <laughs> So perhaps that conclusion should be taken like with a, a pinch of salt. Yeah, which is basically like what I've just in applied. But at the very least, the researcher does in apply that our motivations may not always be as unpleasant as we in lessons really believe. Yeah, so quite an interesting one because reality TV. Uh, to be honest, so the only two reality TV programs because of like that definition would be well, one more would be the Great British Bake Off in the autumn. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, just because it's entertaining and in the autumn there's not exactly like much on <laughs> and to be honest um that celebrity goggle box is the only one that i actually watch because well because of the celebrities are actually like quite funny like most of the time and i uh, yes and i, I don't watch like the normal one but if you've never watched like um a celebrity goggle box before as sad as it sounds like what it is is that basically people watching telly and then you get to see the like reaction and speaking of which in last week's episode because like it's over now like for the series they were watching like love island which is a massive reality tv program in the uk and i'm sorry if you watch it i just don't see the point in it i think it's quite horrific and it's just no and it's just no it's not my cup of tea it's not what i call entertainment so i hope you enjoy the psychology news section even though it was a little bit like different today so but let's move on to the personal update and it turns out that this was actually episode 162 so i'm sorry about that so before I actually go online to the personal update, but this is sort of like connected, I uh, just to all of you, if you're in a like heat wave, if you're in really hot like conditions, please look after yourself. Please drink tons of like water, stay out of the sun, and just have, and basically just follow the health advice that your local authorities are probably like giving you. That the reason why I like, mention that is that uh, because like mainland Europe having like tons of like forest fires in uh, the UK we've had 40 degree heat and it was just apocalyptic basically yeah so like that happened the Monday and Tuesday I think it's been such a long week <laughs> and so much like has that you happened it's actually I've been quite hard to like keep up like with it all though but so Monday and Tuesday I, I think uh, yeah well like, I think though and then on a Tuesday we had tons of like wild yeah well, like wildfires tons of homes are destroyed in the UK 
And yes, basically stuff that has never ever happened before though. Please just like look after you like yourself though. And like as I said to like my fiction email list of like last night I just don't want anything bad happening to any of you. So just please stay safe. Well, but another reason why I actually wanted to mention this was because on the podcast before, especially in this especially in the like psychology news sections, I've actually spoken about climate and anxiety before and to be honest, I've never experienced it. But it was on Tuesday night, I was on like Facebook and like everything and I was seeing like well like friends and family have actually like posted and to be honest at this point um one of the worst fires in like London which ended up destroying seven homes which again never happened in that yeah but like it never happened in the UK before was still not under control I think off the top of my head and there were several people just saying that oh yeah like this is never going to happen again all the climate people were wrong and I just got so annoyed but also so sad because the problem is is that because people aren't taking it seriously or not everyone who needs to take it seriously yeah like aren't they're not going to basically I'm going to get into a bit of like politics here so my uh, apologies is that because let's be a bit like stereotypical here again that sorry because the older generation in my egg experience isn't taking climate change seriously they're going to keep voting for governments that aren't going to tackle climate change climate change will just get worse and worse and worse and again because the governments and the older generation in my egg experience don't believe in the slightest they're not going to prepare so again though but this will just strike our infrastructure worse and worse and worse and it's just like it's so infuriating because I don't because I want this to stop I want change to happen but of course none of it will so this will get worse and worse the older generation in a few decades will sadly die off for meaning that um, us younger generation are just going to have to like um, suffer because of the mistakes of the past and it's just like seriously we know it's happening we have the science we eat yes and to be honest we have the technology to actually change it all we just need the investment and the political will to actually do it all so yeah so to be honest if you're feeling like climate anxiety then i would just say i just want to say that you're not alone a lot of people are like experiencing this and to be honest the, the thing that's actually helped me is I've just like, I've acknowledged that it's going to happen and things will get worse before it gets better. But to be honest, I'm just going like, to keep the though, Tim, just in case it's something actually changes. <laughs> yeah, that and then uh, there are things that, that you can actually do on a like individual level. Uh, yeah, like a level though. So that's sort of like helpful. But yeah, things that will get worse before they get better. Just please just like stay safe though. And as always, I always love to hear your thoughts and feelings on uh, on today's episode. So you can always email me, connorwhitely, connorwhitely.net. You can always leave a comment at the show notes at connorwhitely.net for Wizard slash podcast. And you can always tweet me on Twitter at sci-fi whitely. I always love to hear from all of you because it really helps make the podcast feel like a conversation. And today's episode has been sponsored by a Forensic Psychology Collection. So, a coercive con a troll and a domestic abuse is a crime, well, in some situations, situations which I'm going to get on to in a moment. And this is a great, really easy to understand book. Well, a book that can attain to um, three really popular forensic psychology books so that really does help you to get a deep understanding of the uh, psychology behind crime. That's like, why do people do it? How does in imprisonment work? And most importantly, and one of my favourite favourites is actually how do we get people to stop reoffending? Because I believe it or not, throwing people in jail for like a long period of a, of time doesn't work. But so about these three really popular books are my forensic psychology books. The forensic psychology of theft, burglary, right, theft, burglary, and their property crime. That one's uh, thankfully very uh, popular uh, this month, and my uh, bestseller criminal uh, profile. Uh, so you can get all of those uh, great uh, books, great books in in this one uh, collection, and it's a lot cheaper than uh, buying them individually. So that is the forensic psychology collection available from all major ebook retailers, and you can get the paperback and the hardback version from Amazon, your local bookstore, or and local library if you request it. But if you didn't want to buy a book, I'd be still wanting to give the podcast a bit of like one-time support. 
then at Uber, we can now buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com forward slash Con Whitesley. So that's enough for the personal update. So let's move on to the content part of today's episode. So we're moving on to the content part of today's episode. We're going to look at what is a coercive con natural. And because this is such a good podcast episode, I'm actually just going like, to dive straight into it. Why psychology needs to look at a coercive con natural and a abusive relationships. I always think it's important to highlight why these are important topics to discuss on the podcast. Because that way I know that I tend to focus on them and that you might enjoy them more because of their importance. And I also like to lay down a psychological foundation to right before we dive into the meat of the topic. So in terms of coercive control and abusive relationship, we'll simply ask the question, why don't the victims simply leave the relationship? And this is a very reasonable question, to be honest, especially if you're unfamiliar with the uh, topic. And I think uh, when I was younger, I think I definitely like wanted uh, that too. Yet, from a social psychology and to the need to belong theory, humans are resistant to work in any, any relationship, even ones that are bad for us. In addition, as we are hopefully all outside the abusive relationship, the answer seems so simple out of the abuse. Just report him and leave the relationship. But this is where the reality is different from the ideal and is a lot, a lot more complicated than now this. As well as, whilst there are many different reasons why your victims don't leave the relationship, one of the most common reasons is fear. And whilst the exact definition of fear is hard to pin down, a good definition is something along the lines of a very unpleasant strong emotion caused by a person's amputation and slash or awareness of danger. Due to, like most emotions, fear can range from mild to severe, and the fear could be real or perceived to be real. And what's critical to understand here is that the victim's perception and whether the danger is real or not doesn't matter. What matters is that the fear can be psychological or physical and it can be rather incapacitating and debilitating, making leaving the relationship quite impossible. And I I want to mention the reason why I'm not mentioning the agenda here is because whilst women are the victim in the vast majority of the cases, they are not in every single case and men can be and are still abused in some cases. So I don't want to put agenda here in instead of the word victim and help to force a damaging stereotype. Additionally, to help show the importance of the topic um, some more, here are some numbers from the United States National Coalition Against Domestic Violence. For example, one in nine men and one in four women experience um, severe intimate partner physical violence, intimate partner contact, sexual violence, intimate partner stalking with impacts. And these impacts in include fearfulness, post-traumatic stress disorder, use of victim services, injury and more. Furthermore, one in three women and one in four men have experienced some kind of um, physical violence in the past by an intimate partner. So this includes a a range of uh, behaviour like slapping, pushing and shoving. And in uh, some uh, cases, uh, this uh, might not be considered as domestic abuse when it actually is. Also, one in four women and one in seven men have been victims of severe physical violence, for example, beating, strangling and burning by an intimate partner in their lifetime. As well as one in seven women and one in 25 men men have been injured by an intimate partner. Therefore, as you can now clearly see or hear in like this case, <laughs> regardless of the situation, a gay asset may be like the last one now, Regardless of the gender, gender, a slightly higher number of the both have a experience of domestic violence, and this only um, highlights why it's uh, critical to increase awareness of the uh, topic. What is the coercive con natural? Moving on to the next section, right of the episode, one of the leading authorities in this area is a person called Dr. Evan Stark, and he defines our coercive con natural as the following. Open that quote. A strategic course of oppressive behaviour designed to secure and a caste and a gender-based privilege by depriving women of, her, of their rights and liberties and establishing a regime of domination in that personal life. Close a quote. 
as well as one of the problems out with the literature on Lacroix Connaturalum is that there is no or no easy to find studies that have men as the victims. Now, it would be great to imagine that that meant that no men falls under this area. But given how the myth of men being domestically abused is a false, I personally doubt this and think and think that this is a massive gap in the literature. literature. Because you seriously cannot imagine out of every single man on the planet, and at this point there must be at least four billion men, not a single one of them is being coercively controlled. I think that's rather far-fetched. Four billion and none of them being coercively controlled. Just a thought though. Moreover, Stark adds in his work that 60%, 80% of all abused are women experience that coercive con natural lab beyond the use of a physical abuse, meaning that the physical abuse might have been stopped, but the coercive con natural lab continues. And a coercive con natural lab can have deadly consequences, as Stark argues that coercive con natural is strongly correlated with murder. For example, for the sake of of uh, illustration purposes only, uh, between the years 2000 and 2006, 3,200 American soldiers uh, were killed in uh, combat. But during uh, the same time, time, three times as many women uh, were murdered by their husbands or boyfriends. As a brother, one woman is uh, murdered at every uh, 16 hours in the United States, even by a current or former male uh, partner. And that is just horrific. With the victims most at risk of fire being murdered are the people in which a domestic violence, stalking, and coercive control happens at the same time, and add domestic violence and stalking is common. The role of a narcissistic personality disorder. Interestingly, there is some evidence that a narcissistic person personality disorder is involved in a coercive control alongside antisocial personality disorder, as all three of them are right, are common amongst perpetrators of domestic violence, with people having a narcissistic personality disorder being described as um, as uh, manipulative, demanding, arrogant, and self censored and they exhibit as these five of the following traits: exploitation of others, a lack of empathy, envious of others have a need to form excessive admiration, a, a grandiose sense of self in, in importance, busy with fancies of unlimited power, beauty, I, ideal love, success and uh, brilliance, a belief about themselves uh, being uh, special and that uh, can only be understood by or associated with uh, special people and institutions, arrogant, condescending attitudes or behaviours, sense of entitlement. How is a coercive control criminalised? So, for the last part of today's episode, we need to address the very harsh topic of coercive control and the legal system. Due to very few elements of a coercive control are technically a crime, and a criminal and a psychological abuse is always harder to get evidence for and to prosecute compared to physical abuse. And yes, I know physical abuse is getting prosecuted is that hard enough? This sadly observes in the identification, criminally charging and prosecution of bad coercive controlled cases are to be very much beyond challenging. To make matters worse, are successfully prosecuting coercive controlled cases are incredibly rare. Yet there is a bit of hope because if a case does move forward to trial, then the case will probably be a plea bargained. In addition, if you live in um, Ireland, England, Wales, Scotland and France, then you're in a luck because these are countries have uh, criminalised coercive controls, but the United States has not. New York State has become the first state in, a, in, a, in that entire country to, to start introducing uh, criminalising legislation for coercive control as a, a Class E felony. And something that I really do in in a joy about the podcast is that I'm always like learning that well, because of when I actually like typed in classy felonies, I actually thought that it was just a, that it was actually just like a American um, thing. Other well, but it actually turns out that the UK has it. But to the well, what this means for like America is that a, a classy felony 
is uh, punishable uh, by a maximum fine of two hundred and fifty thousand uh, dollars and uh, slash or a, a maximum of five years in imprisonment but it has to be more than one year and i actually like i did a check at the uh, new york state senate uh, uh, like website uh, for the bill and it actually turns out that it's currently in uh, committee though so what i presume that that means is that they're still debating it Basing it though, and the like, website showed that it has a another four uh, right to that it has another four stages to pass until it is signed or vetoed by the New York governor. And that website was just complicated. Sorry, like New Yorkers, <laughs> that website's complicated. Conclusion. So at the end of the episode, I want to say yeah, that coercive con natural isn't that right isn't that just another facet of that abuse to look at it is a very serious and i truly hope that none of us will ever experience it and whilst we didn't look at how to avoid it and recognize the signs in this episode i do want to do that in the future just to help protect all of us a little more but until then coercive control and abuse that might be a dark topic to look at but it is a fascinating and are very much worth investigating because you never know when it might be useful. So I really hope that you enjoyed today's episode and that you got something out of it. Well, I know that I did, and I definitely think that the podcast will um, will return to the topic of our coercive con on that troll in the future. And if you know someone who would enjoy today's episode, then please share it with them. I'm always really grateful when you wonderful people help spread the words hey, about the podcast. And definitely check out Forensic Psychology Collection, available in all the usual places. And don't forget to buy me a coffee.com forward slash conversely. If you didn't want to buy a book, I'd be still wanting to see a port the podcast, the podcast a little bit. So have a great day, everyone, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to see the show notes, then please go to conorwhitesley.net. And if you want a free eight book psychology box set, then please go to conorwhitesley.net. Have a great day and I'll see you next time.